What a tragedy. What a tragedy if that moment finds him unprepared or unqualified for the work which would be his finest hour. What a tragedy if the moment comes to where we can get exactly what we've wanted in life and yet we're not prepared or we're not qualified. What a tragedy if that moment comes and the people who work with us have that opportunity and they're not prepared and they're not qualified. What we want to do this afternoon in the few minutes that we have together is to work together to see how we can prepare for that special moment. We don't know when it will come. It could come in three days. It could come in 30 days. It could come in three years. It might come in 30 years. But whenever that time comes, we need to be ready. We need to be prepared to be the very, very best to elevate ourselves to the level that we're trying to accomplish. You know, in rooms like this, as well as rooms all over America, people are always asking the question, how can we win? How can we win? Well, it doesn't matter which discipline you come from within our organization here. Winning really comes from three different areas that we have to be the very best at. The first area is that we have to have a personal passion to win because there's a price to be paid for it. Winning is not easy. Winning is not something that is just even natural. Winning takes us doing things that are sometimes unnatural for us. So we have to have that personal passion to where we'll do anything that we can to make ourselves successful as well as the organization that we've, that we've chosen to work for here. The second thing that it takes as we're learning how to win is we need to make better choices. You know, uh, as Jackie said, I, I worked for FedEx and I worked for Xerox for many years. And one thing that I learned early on is that uh, at Xerox, we would have President's Club to where all of our top performers would go on a, uh, on a trip somewhere, and it was really a nice thing to do and everything. But what I learned at President's Clubs and going to all of them is that it was the same people that showed up every year. It wasn't because of their territories. It wasn't because that they just got the best breaks. It was because they developed habits which were better than other people's habits were. And they made better choices along the way. If you look at leadership, the best leaders within organizations are the ones who make the best choices, obviously. But the flip side of that, the best leaders also get out of their wrong choices faster. So we have both of those things working for us. How can we make better choices so that we can become the very best at what we've chosen to do? And the third thing it comes down to is leadership. We are constantly leading others. A lot of people will say, well, you know, leadership comes from the top and it's, it, it really doesn't have anything to do with me. That You couldn't be further from the truth. You see, leadership exists throughout the organization, all the way through to the lowest level uh, employee on the proverbial uh, pyramid, all the way through. The very basic definition of leadership is having influence on others. Everybody has influence. In fact, if you've got somebody on your team that's a negative, cynical person, they'll have ten times the influence on your team than a positive person would. That's not fair, but that's the way that it is. You see, everybody in our group, in our work group, and the people that we work around, the people we're around outside our business, we need to be with people who we want to be more like because that's what we'll become. We'll become more like the people that we're around than we will uh, just the ideal person that we might want to be. A couple of facts before we get started. First fact is that orchestrating success demands that we do things differently. It demands that we leave our comfort zone. It demands that we're a little bit uncomfortable. There's nothing wrong with being uncomfortable. In fact, it's good. It leads us to better choices sometimes. So orchestrating success demands that we live our, uh, beyond our comfort zone. Second thing is that we live by choice, not by chance. Now, if you're here thinking that I'm going to tell you that all the successful people are the ones that are luckiest, that's not what you're going to hear. The successful people are the ones who have lived by their choices and not just waited on things to happen to them that provided the success that they were hoping for. Third thing is that people follow people. 
People follow people. People don't follow mission statements, although they're nice to have. People don't follow anything that's on the wall, although they might be beautiful and be, have, serve a purpose. People don't follow screensavers. People don't follow emails. People don't follow voicemails. People don't follow text messages. People follow people. You have more influence over the people that you're around every day than all of those other things combined. People follow people. And so if we want people to be following us, we have to understand that everything that we do counts. There's not a time that we can just take our hat off and say, hey, this really doesn't count, but I'm going to tell you the way it really is. You can't do that. People follow people. The last thing up here is that we can't orchestrate success alone. No matter how you define success, no matter where you're coming from on what success will be, and it's, it's normally not uh, monetarily, but no matter how you define success, you have to have others with you on the trip. So as we work our way through this today, I'm going to talk about three different types of choices that we make to help us become those redwoods so that we can stand tall through whatever happens. The first choice is the character choices. Those choices are about what we really believe, what our character really is. We make those choices internally. People don't even know what those choices are because we make them internally. We don't normally share those. Second type of choices are action choices. People see those. What do we do? Uh, that's what they see. And the third type of choice is the investment choice, which is not investing in the stock market or investing in any kind of financial thing. It's investing in other people and investing in ourselves so that we can become the very best at these jobs that we've all chosen to do. The character choices have four choices. And you'll see in your book, as you see this, we're not, we don't have time to go through all 12 of these choices. We'll be hitting on four of them. But the character choice... Uh, one of the character choices, the first one is to, is to make the choice to, be, to never be a victim. In other words, making the choice of responsibility. I accept responsibility for everything that happens, even if it's not fair. Even if I didn't deserve it. The choice of responsibility. I've got a, a buddy of mine who is a, a sports psychologist for the PGA Tour. And his name is David Cook. And he says that in every round of golf at that level, which is the highest level of golf there is, and these guys are unbelievably good, he says that every round of golf, three things happen to every player that might not be fair. He says, you know, you might hit the ball 310 yards right dead nut down the middle of the fairway, and you get there and you're in somebody else's divot. Well, that's not fair. You did exactly what you were supposed to do. You hit it exactly where you were trying to, to hit it, and yet you got stuck in a circumstance that just really is not fair. Or, he says, you might be hitting a second shot up to a 150-yard uh, shot over a bunker and onto the green, and as soon as you hit it, you hit it just perfect. You hit an 8-iron perfect, which is the right stick for that distance, and all of a sudden the wind comes up and knocks it down, and it plugs it into the bunker in front of the green. Well, that's not fair. You hit the shot you were supposed to hit, and yet this external thing happened to you. Or you might be putting. you got a 20-foot putt, and it's going dead nut center for the hole, and all of a sudden it hits somebody else's spike mark, and it moves off. Well, that's not fair. But what he says is that what separates the greatest golfers, the greatest golfers in the world from everybody else it's not all the other shots that happen. What separates them is what they do with the things that are not fair. How do we handle those? And that's the same way it is uh, with success, and we'll be talking about that. Second choice is commitment choice. We'll be talking about commitment as well. Third one is values, and the last one is integrity. Let's start off with the, the no victim choice. The bottom line on this is that until we accept responsibility, no matter what, no matter what, we'll not be able to put in place plans to achieve our goals. Now, what's more likely is the sign up there. You know, it's 
It's his fault, it's hers fault, it's their fault, it's not my fault. Well, those are easy to say. And everybody has those on their agenda sometime or another where they, they throw the fault game out. But the bottom line is, is accepting responsibility is our choice. Now, it might not be fair like those golf uh, scenarios that I shared with you. But our job is to take whatever happens and move it forward. Doesn't mean Pollyanna, things, only good things are going to happen to us. It means whatever happens, we move it forward. And we become better because of our influence on that situation, no matter what. Well, that's sort of the challenge, is the no matter what, because we all have things that happen to us. Stuff happens. You know, we have to deal with people around our organization. We have to deal with clients. If we didn't have any clients, it'd be real easy to be a great leader, wouldn't it? We have to deal with budgets. We have to do things physically responsible. So the no matter what is really the challenge that we all have, but we do have choices to make. We can make the choice to be average, continue doing what we've always been doing, and we're already above average, but we can make a choice to be where we are. Or we can make a choice to be great. We can make a choice to be a victim, or we can make a choice to be responsible. We're responsible for this, now let's fix it. We can make a choice to be a passenger, we'll just go wherever the drivers are taking us, or we can make a choice to be a driver, taking the wheel and doing something with what we have. If you look at the left side of those choices there, average victim passenger, they sort of go together, I don't think anybody wants to be, be described like that. You're an average victim passenger. That's not a good deal. If you look at great responsible driver, that goes together too. If you want to accomplish what you have set forth for yourself to accomplish, there's a price to be paid for it, and the first part of that price is the price of responsibility. John Wooden was a basketball coach at UCLA many years ago, arguably the best ever. Uh, in, in my book, he certainly was. He said, and I think he summed it up better than anybody, any one sentence I've ever seen, and that is, things turn out best for people who make the best of the way things turn out. That's pretty good. Things turn out best for people who make the best of the way things turn out. Accepting responsibility. The second foundation uh, principle that I want to talk about is commitment. You know, and there's a big, a big difference between being just interested and being committed. A lot of people are interested in success, but they don't want to pay the price of commitment to be there. In fact, if, if you go in January, most, a lot of people will have a, uh, uh, what do you call them, a uh, New Year's resolution. Thanks. They'll have a New Year's resolution. That New Year's resolution, they're going to start working out, and they're going to start doing this and doing that and doing, doing all of this. Well, and they do that. You go in January, the treadmills are full. You can't even get one. You can't get on any machine in there because in January, everybody's made the same commitment to themselves. You go in July to the same place, and you can have your whole dog sled team in there with you. There's plenty of room for everybody. You see, that's really the, the difference between being interested and being committed, the people who are interested are the ones who will, will go when it's convenient. The people who are committed will go whenever it is, not just when it is convenient. If you look at organizations, the principal cause of stress uh, within organizations is because sometimes we're not committed all the way to do things that we need to do. We're interested, but we change our mind. In fact, we might one day say this is important, the next day this is important, the next day this is, the next day this is, and you're going all over the place. Well, confusion is the greatest stressor that you can add to your team. If they're confused, you don't know which direction they're going to go, nor do you have the right to ask them to go your direction if they're confused about which direction you're telling them to go. Here's where I want you to use your paper. Everybody get your paper out. Thing uh, I want to talk briefly about is integrity, and the reason I talk briefly about it is because it needs to be talked about, 
but we don't have enough time to talk about everything, and I don't want to minimize it. I just want to tell you a couple of things on it. Our integrity as leaders and within our organization, our home and everywhere else, there's two key things to start off with. Number one is that you're always leading. People are watching. That's not the question, are they watching? What the question is, is what are they seeing? You're always leading. And the second thing is that everything counts. You see, according to a study of 1,300 executives, out of 16 traits responsible for enhancing effectiveness, 71% said that integrity was at the top of their... 71%, can you imagine getting 71% of senior executives to agree on anything? 71%, that's pretty awesome. Then if you look at uh, the people that you work with, your vendors, their number one expectation is just do what you say you're going to do. Consider it done. Do what you say you're going to do. Then if you look at your employees, they'll say that the most important thing that they need from their leader is that integrity. Because, see, if you don't have integrity, if you've, if you've, if you've sacrificed your integrity somewhere, then you're going to lose their trust. And once you lose their trust, you're going to lose the ability to develop them to be what they want to be. And once you lose your, your ability to develop them, then you lose your followers. And once you lose your followers, you've got nobody to lead anyway. So it really all starts with our integrity. Do we do what we say we're going to do? When we say we're going to do it, can they consider it done? Can they walk out the room and know that it's going to be done and done to the level that we're looking for? One thing that we have to be aware of is that ignoring issues puts our integrity at risk. Problems don't go away. It'd be nice, but problems don't go away. And if you're ignoring an issue, and there's a, there's a story in the book about this uh, that, you, that you'll probably be able to relate to, but if you're ignoring an issue, that issue will just get bigger as opposed to going away. You see, there's a, there's a rule called the 110-100 rule. And that is, if you have an issue that comes about in your workplace, you have a choice to make. That choice could be that you, you, that you attack the issue right where it is. If you choose to not do that, and if you choose to allow it to grow and allow it to get bigger within your organization and maybe move into your whole work team, the same thing that you could have fixed for one, one unit of measurement of time, money, whatever you want to use, you could have fixed for one, now cost you ten times that to fix. And then if you allow it to continue on, and it gets maybe into your customer base, or maybe into different departments, the same thing that you could have chosen to fix for one, now cost you ten to fix, but you chose not to, now cost you a hundred to fix. See, problems don't go away. Where most people lose their integrity is not necessarily in just making really bad choices that make all the news. It's making these smaller choices of just trying to ignore something and then they don't trust you to take care of the problems that you've got. It's not the big things. It's all these small things that add up to where we keep our integrity.